Within a few years, more than 5,000 intellectuals, worldwide, have outed themselves openly, online by signing their legitimate doubts about the authenticity of William Shakespeare from Stratford. Reasonable doubts, inherently, had to lead to the search for alternative candidates for the playwright genius of the works of Hamlet, Othello, King Lear, Romeo and Juliet, and so on. Such reasonable doubts, ever since have been ridiculed by their opponents, because of the impossible and devious number of 75 candidates, having been collected. Stratfordians were never ready, reflecting more plausible theories with no necessary 75 candidates but with a singular, outstanding artistic and spiritual contemporary genius, identical with the true Shakespeare, having fabricated, for life-saving reasons, ingeniously, multiple faked identities of himself. The greatest misconception was possibly, to look for a single, other name of the true playwright genius, instead of realizing that the only existing true, life-threatened poet and dramatist genius was forced to abandon identity in name and to make himself invisible with a multiplicity of pseudonyms, including Shakespeare, Drayton, Chapman, Haywood, and so on, but also with much lesser known contemporary poet pen names. This shall be the principal focus of this present video. Let's collect, and number those questions, why Richard Brome could best have been a pen name, of the true Shakespeare. As long as a plausible authorship theory of the true Shakespeare, that is, concealed Marlowe living, under multiple pseudonyms, will be drawn into ridicule, versus a faked authorship idea, that is, the illiterate Stratford man. There will be no hope, that a Brome Shakespeare Marlowe connection will ever be accepted as a reasonable resolution for too many unanswerable authorship questions. Let's continue with reflecting contextual arguments for number six, Richard Brome. The text underneath Brome's only extant portrait informs us, allegorically, about two different faces we will discover. Just read and listen. Reader, look here, you will two faces find. One, of the body, the other, of the mind. This by the graver so, that with much strife. We think Brome dead, he is drawn so to the life. That by his own pen is done so ingeniously. That, who reads it, must think, he never shall die. Why two faces? Doesn't that point to a split identity? Why we think, he is dead. What has he written, with his own pen, so ingeniously? Who reads it, must think, he never shall die. Meaning, he is immortal.
16 plays of Brome were staged in the third decade of the 17th century, with great success. Why serious questions have so rarely been asked, and never been answered satisfactorily, by academia? Such as, Why virtually nothing is known about Brome's personal identity and family. Not even his alleged birth date, 1590, is certain. Why his ingenious dramatic writing activities began only beyond his 40th year of life, in the 1630s. Why his pen had done, that is, written, nothing in the first four decades of his life. Where did he, resembling to William from Stratford, receive his eminent literary poetical training and education? How and when did he arrive at his brilliant playwright dramatic talent? Why there exist no independent sources from Brougham's time in London, since his plays mirror intense connections to London's middle-class society in the 1630s? How to explain the singular matter of a dual authorship of Broom and Haywood in the Lancashire Witches play? Why there exists no inner logical justification for two separate authors? Why there exists no reasonable determination of the part attributable to Haywood? Is it coincidental that chief editor of the unique website Brome Online, Richard Cave points to the characteristic of Brome's artistry by referencing with dramas of Shakespeare, such as Timon of Athens, The Merchant of Venice, The Winter's Tale, etc. How to explain that you can locate, with the search engine of Richard Brome Online, almost 200 connections of Brome's 16 plays to significant contextual aspects of Shakespeare. Is it purely coincidental that as in Brome's Antipodes, we find in Shakespeare's The Tempest also an epilogue that asked the audience to pardon the play and players? Is it even conceivable that only half a decade after the printing of the first folio, an almost unbelievable playwright genius dominates the London theatre again. Brome's playwright skills and inner connections to Shakespeare's plays and dramaturgy are analysed and commented by the nine literary experts of the editorial panel of Richard Brome online in a remarkable manner. Listen. Richard Cave, the novella, is surely a magnificent celebration of the arts of the theatre. The antipodes, the particular excellencies of Brome's dramaturgy, the excellencies are many. Julie Sanders, Sparagus, remarkable play, of skill and art involved in living in an urban context. Northern Lasse, a rapid sequence of confused identities. Reveals selves and conscious metamorphoses. Marion O'Connor, Queen's Exchange, a nicely tragic comic twist. Lucy Monroe, Queen and Concubine, one of the openly radical combative plays of the decade, it thoroughly deserves attention. Michael Leslie, New Academy, the creation of a master of his craft. Well worth staging. Covent Garden, a deep and pioneering exploration of the role of identity. Eleanor Lowe, Lovesick Court, concerns with dualism and their exploration. Through parallel plots, fundamentally a dramatic text. Helen Ostovich, a jovial crew, a gratifying demonstration of the potential impact of theater. Matthew Stegel, the English Moor, one of the most creative traces. Elizabeth Schaefer, the city wit, Brome capable of and theatrically intelligent writing. Would not have to be invented here, at the latest, 
the Marlowe theory. That is, surviving true Shakespeare alias Richard Brome. A main reason of a recent Thomas Overbury video, see link above, was to demonstrate that the author of the poem, A Wife, can by no means have been the poisoned Thomas Overbury, but the true Shakespeare himself, with his unparalleled unique qualities of an artistic hermaphrodite personality and genius. Why to mention this? Because in the early Brome play of the Northern Lasse, some crucial information about the background of the author Brome, at the end of the dedicatoire epistle, makes only sense if we relate them, not to a female, but to male Richard Brome, by exchanging the female attributes, her, she, to appropriate males, him, he. Brome ambiguously equated himself with Minerva, Roman goddess of wisdom, justice, and sponsor of the arts. Analog to Greek goddess Athena. Friends, by whose good liking, he prosperously lived, until his late long silence, and discontinuance, to which he was compelled, gave him justly to fear their loss, and his own decay. Wherefore he, now, desirous to settle himself in some worthy service, and no way willing, like some of further breed, to return from this southern sunshine, back to his native air. I thought it might become my care. Isn't this a stunning, veiled, and very tricky blueprint, of the true Shakespeare's destiny? He prosperously lived, until his late, long silence, and discontinuance, to which he was compelled, justly, to fear his loss and his own decay, desirous to settle in some worthy service, and no way willing, to return from this southern sunshine, back to his native air. Be aware. There are various, strange inconsistencies, related to Richard Brome. We know virtually nothing about him, but from encyclopedias. Such as Britannica, we learn, that Richard Brome was for some years. In the service of Ben Jonson. Solely derived from a dedicatoire sonnet of Jonson to Brome, at the beginning of his printed play. The Northern Lasse. Johnson notices, at the beginning of the sonnet, that he had him, Brome, for a servant, once, according to the shorter Oxford English Dictionary, once definitely means, one time only. The myth of Brome, as servant to Johnson, seems more like the aberrant spawn of a literary fantasy, as an established fact. All the more so, as the final couplet of the sonnet, disparagingly portrays the person addressed. A cobbler, as a pilot, who cannot handle a plow. In the poetical context with a cobbler, mustn't Johnson have allegorically uncovered his subtle relationship to Brome, as the faked Shakespeare, alias Marlowe, the cobbler's son? This question, what subtle type of a relation? between Brome and Johnson existed, is fully answered in Brome's epistle to the reader of the second five new plays. There he stunningly reveals the reader.
that those new plays we must not think them posthumous productions after the author's death they were all begotten born and owned by him many years since And yet there are the plays of a sort, one could think, they diminish the author's worth. When they speak the relation, he had to Ben Jonson. I desire, the plays would name any other, that could better teach a man, to write a good play. And for this purpose, I have prefixed in this volume. Ben Jonson's own testimony. To. His. Servant. Our. Author. Note, his servant, that is, our true author, looks, now, for other magisterials, since Johnson once wrote, about true Shakespeare, in his works, in a false praise, I shall draw envy on thy name, and in the first folio, he wrote, small Latin and less Greek, Can anyone really overlook those definite, elusive, quotations of Brome to Johnson's envy of the true, concealed poet genius, Shakespeare? Is it purely coincidental that the search engine of Brome Online reveals 257 contextual references and connections between Brome's plays and Ben Jonson? Has not this more to do with lifelong tensions between the true author and Jonson than with obscure Brome? A short detour to Johnson's epigrams. Consider. Johnson definitely was the contemporary chief witness of the true Shakespeare's authorship issue. Why in other, similar epigrams of Johnson, here examples number 30, 87, 115. Academia never tried to elaborate, who might have been hiding behind those obscure, unnamed persons.
Does anyone know, a more suited person, than the true Shakespeare, alias Concealed Marlowe? Who is meant, but not allowed to be named? In the following epigrams, of Johnson? Just listen and reflect. Epigram 30. Entitled, To Person Guilty. Guilty, be wise, and though you know the crimes be thine, I tax, yet do not own my rhymes, it were madness in thee, to betray thy fame, and person to the world. Before I thy name. Epigram 87, entitled, To one, that desired me, not to name him. Be safe, nor fear thyself so good a fame, that, any way, my book should speak thy name. For, if thou shame, ranked with my friends, to go, I am more ashamed to have thee thought my foe. Beginning of Epigram 115, entitled, On the Town's Honest Man. You wonder, who this is? And, why name him not? that boasts so good a fame, naming so many, too. But, this is one, suffers no name, but a description, being no vicious person, but the vice. Do you see any valid reason, why academia did not even made a tentative effort to identify, this name, of a man, with such a fame? Did you ever ask yourself, why the immense literary work of the true, Shakespeare, does not contain more autobiographical references, related to the author's life experience? Consider the life of poet genius Christopher Marlowe, who had to abandon identity and name, for life-saving reasons, taken the crown the oath, never to reveal his secret, was forced to live, and write, under false identities and names for a lifetime, thus permanently evade, any discernibility. This enforced life experience clearly has been reflected in his works, considering the extent to which existential life-related terms such as disguise, banishment, exile, concealment, secrecy etc. played a role in his plays and life. If we count with modern search engines, those life-related terms, used by the true Shakespeare, and compare them with Brougham's use, we get some valuable information, inevitably provoking some questions. Do you know of any other contemporary poet, with such an amount and concordance, of life-related terms? Can this really have happened purely by chance? Christina Paravano, concluded in her book on Brome's multilingualism. About this professional playwright Brome. Shrouded in mystery about birthplace, family ties, and education. That he shared the skill of other dramatists, such as Shakespeare, Decker, Marston, Middleton. Rome, one of the most responsive to foreign languages. He was the playwright of the period, who portrayed more foreigners, both continental and people from other parts of England, than any other of his contemporaries. Rome stands out from his peers for his originality and the topicality of his plays, attributable to his extensive recourse to multilingualism. Doesn't this phenomenal multilingualism, with Latin, Greek, French, Italian, Spanish, Dutch, of a playwright genius. So shortly following the first folio, supports the Marlowe thesis, having continued his literary mastership under new names. The amount of inconsistencies of unsolved questions, connected with Richard Brome, justify the assumption of a multipseudonymity thesis of the true Shakespeare, alias Brome.
similar to Richard Brome, there are serious inconsistencies. Unanswered questions, and strange references of May, to the true Shakespeare. That need clarification. What are the arguments, to recognize in Thomas May a potential pseudonym? Of the true Shakespeare? Is it really coincidental, that Marlowe translated Lucan's epic, Latin poem, Pharsalia, in jambic pentameter, telling the story of the civil war, between Caesar and Pompey. Whereas, years later May translated the same work in two steps, in rhymed verses. Have you ever thought about, how few people, at the time, were given the exceptional ability, to transform an extensive Latin text, not only into an English text, but at the same time into a rhymed poem form? Consider an analogous situation. How many ingenious composers, at Mozart's time, were given the exceptional ability, to compose so endless many, masterpieces, following each other? I guess, almost no one. Although the translations of Marlowe and Thomas May's Lucan's Vesalia are not the same, there is much to indicate, that the same author deliberately translated the Marlowe text, previously printed, differently from May's text, in order to disguise himself as the already known author. From a viewpoint of a probability calculation, how likely is it, that within such a small text, Marlowe and May used not only stunning congruent word combinations. The Impious War. Crassus Ghost. Proud Babylon. Nilu's Mouth Slash Spring. But. But also geographical terms. Obviously and deliberately. Differing between Marlowe and May. The Contextual Contents of Anonymous, Wits Recreations A Contemporary Bestseller Verse Miscellany of Epigrams and Epitaphs In the 1640s, 50s, with varying titles Leaves little doubt, that is had been written by concealed, true Shakespeare Alias Marlowe In Epigram 42, Dealing with Thomas May we learn allegorically that May finished the translation of Lucan's Pharsalia. May's fame is equal, compared to the author, but May's fate is better. May has got King Charles his love, the author Nero's hate. You should be fully aware, that Lucan's fate. Analogue to Marlowe. During the Emperor Nero's reign, was disastrous. He had to die in his twenties. May translated not only Lucan's De Bello Civili, Pharsalia, but also famous Roman poet Marshall's epigrams, with the spectacles and the five books. In the epistle to the reader, May confesses some problems with his translation, that is, with the subject of some diver's construction of sense. He could not leave out the first in the spectacles, laying around with him for years. In the first martial epigram, upon the spectacles, May constructs a new sense, when telling the history. Not of the mythical Leander, but, of the personate Leander, who was here saved. Whereas the mythical Leander drowned in the Hellespont. His, life but going spared returning take.
Is there any reason why May was putting the Latin phrase on the title page? That is translated. There will be neither crime nor glory. Meaning, Marlowe was not guilty, but forfeited all his reputation. For William Percy, the context of various lines of his single extant sonnet cycle may suffice to accept him as a pseudonym of the true Shakespeare. The poem cycle of 20 sonnets by William Percy, in 1594. To the fairest Coelia, that is, Queen Elizabeth. Only month after Marlowe's final disappearance. Reveals us the immense suffering from the poet's immediate destiny. In Sonnet 1. Percy expresses his immediate judgment by doom to endless pain. He is outing his sorrow passion. A sentence, judgment, punishment, was given to him on no occasion. His doom is past, but it cannot be undone. What other fine sonnetier than the true Shakespeare? In 1594 is imaginable? Considering the following key phrase. In Sonnet 20, My lifeless body, forlorn, alone, I'll spend them all, the remnant of my days, concealed, in ceaseless tears. William Percy's comedy, The Aphrodisial, or, Sea Feast, never printed, or staged before, were printed and edited in these days, stunningly even twice, by Maria Schmeigel, and, Anna Faktorovich. On the back cover of their book editions we read divergent, but astonishing, reflections about this comedy. Schmergel. The play offers a retelling of Hero and Leander. Note, the poetical parable of Marlowe's destiny. Faktorovich. The comedy takes to an extreme the trope of disguise with identities. Other than the one they present themselves. Aren't these conclusive thoughts, to Percy's comedy? The retelling of Hero and Leander, and life, as a disguise of identity. The perfect autobiographical blueprint of the true Shakespeare, alias Marlowe.
the circumstances of Southwell's life, as a Jesuit missionary, with his imprisonment from June 1592, until his execution in February 1595, cast serious doubt for the form, in which his personal poems have come down to us. He is unlikely, to have had any hand in the preparation of the first volume, of St. Peter's Complaint in 1595. Nor can his personal authorization be claimed, for any of the manuscript collection. Southwell was indicted before the Privy Council as a traitor, after eluding six years of escape and three years of brutal torture. None of his single literary work, attributed to him, before his hanging, February 1595, bore his name, but initials like S, W. It is generally accepted, that there is a strange, influence, of England's secret Catholic martyr, Southwell, on the true Shakespeare as well as on Drayton and others. Shakespeare's intertextual referencing, of the works of Southwell, is extensive, and enables us, to see the plays through Shakespeare's eyes. For instance Portia's word after Prince Aragon's failure of the caskets. Thus has the candle singed the moth. And compare it, to Southwell's lines. So long the fly doth dally, with the flame, until his, singed, wings do force his fall. Literary Southwell experts, such as Brownlow, Klaus, Devlin, Sweeney, and others. In their books, all have noticed and elaborated stunning contextual and congenial poetic connections between Shakespeare and Southwell. There is a yet unthought and unimaginable, but not unplausible explanation. Worth reflecting, however only in case of considering the Shakespeare Marlowe authorship thesis. Southwell's famous poem, St. Peter's Complaint, suggests, that it was or must have been, written by the real or true Shakespeare, that is, the presumably killed, but living concealed Marlowe, L.N. 1595, was without identity in name. He, the true Shakespeare, alias Marlowe, used Southwell's martyr situation to conceal, that is, to mirror his own analog fate parable-like allegorically, in a breathtaking poetical manner. Behind the destiny of contemporary Catholic martyr, Robert Southwell. An example. The author in stanza 19. Highly allegorical, asks. Whether it needs his unaccustomed soil. The marl, yielding perjuries may spoil a good field and not fat a barren field. And in stanza 21. Why he was named son of a dove. Not related to the bird of love. But, his, stony name, Marl. Much better sweets his fall. Can these lines. The covert allegorical revelation of the author. Be interpreted differently. In the most famous Christmas poem, The Burning Babe, attributed to Southwell. The adorable, babe, will become the bloody crucified, Christ. We move from from a, frosty, Christmas winter night to a burning, hot, extinction. A Marlowe classics, of its perfected poetical and literary contradictions. Southwell expert Anne, Sweeney, characterized Southwell's literary competence in the highest terms possible. Was there any room left at all in the same time period for the true Shakespeare? 
he was revolutionizing the nature of English poetry. Southwell formed part of a crossing point, from artistic visual imagery to creative literature, that empowered the English creative writer, and provided a fruitful stylistic template for the work of later writers. Most of alleged Southwell's lines in his poem, I Die Alive, do not fit the Catholic martyr, Southwell, nearly as well as it does Christopher Marlowe. He declares, I live, but such a life, that is, his concealed identity, is ever dying. He does die, but his death never ends. His special death denies to end his dying life. His staying alive, no wit can amend, it's a living death. Nevertheless, even alive, he still dies, though, also, still reviving. His living death is fed by dying life. Grace more than nature, that is his genius, keeps him alive. Though his idle hopes and vain desires are gone, he still expects a second life with future glory. The present dangers represent the deaths he feels. Equally, the alleged author of The Triumphs Over Death cannot have been Robert Southwell. He didn't triumph over death, he was hanged and quartered. Southwell, in 1595 was no more able to comfort the afflicted minds with the cares of dying friends. The true author of this poem had given up his initial idea to write the poem for one, that is, a singular person, that is the martyr Southwell, imprisoned and tortured since three years, but to disclose it, his destiny, for the public world. The title informations, like incidentally, disclose already the whole truth. There can be little doubt that the initial dedicatory acrostic poem in The Triumphs Over Death of an obscure John Trussell unites two different authors, Southwell and Marlowe, and points ultimately to the second author, Marlowe, as the composer of the poem, who finally triumphed over death. The work of Southwell is worth your view. Don't hinder him, he wrote it for your good. You are unkind if you reprehend him, since it is presented to you for your profit. He wrote it, I made it public to pleasure you. Esteem both that as we both shall merit it. Why his work's worth accept my good will. Otherwise his labor which crossed mine is lost both without an end, lest my goodwill and small defects fulfill. 
Here, his, his talent trebled, do present. I my poor might, yet both with good intend. Then, take them kindly, both. As we them meant. Be aware, that at the same time, there existed another poem, also with Christ's triumph and victory over death, by Giles Fletcher, 1610, which has argumentatively been analyzed as a definitive early composition of the surviving concealed Marlowe. Please note, Giles Fletcher, in the epistle to the reader is explaining the title line, Christ's victory over death, that he be not thought dead men, whilst he remains among the living. A preserved draft of Robert Southwell's, St. Peter's Complaint, in his own handwriting, is compatible, according to graphological experts with the handwritings of Shakespeare, Hand D, and Marlowe, the guys. In 1586 an unknown poet, Geoffrey Whitney published the first English emblem book, with 248 emblems from various artists and origins, each accompanied with a woodcut, with a title motto and an English poem, of one or more six-line stanzas.
We do know virtually nothing. From that English poet Whitney, not even his birth or death day. His reputation today depends exclusively upon his celebrated emblem book from 1586. The full title further informs us. Englished and moralized. For the most part. Gathered out of sundry writers. With double delight, both fit for the virtuous and for the wicked. Encyclopedias assume that Whitney lived for a while in Leiden, Holland, where, according to Anthony Wood, he was in great esteem among his countrymen for his ingenuity. It is not known how long he stayed in Holland and when he returned to England. The verses are of great merit and always show extensive learning. With translations and adaptations of Horace, Ovid, Anacreon and others, From Henry Green's book, Shakespeare, and the Emblem Writers. We learn that there exist not only great similarities between Shakespeare and Whitney but also exact parallelisms of ideas and words, fully justifying the conclusion that Whitney's emblem texts were well known to true Shakespeare, or even more logical and plausible. They were composed by him. Thus Whitney, a covert pen name of True Shakespeare. Please reflect the observation that in this same year, 1585 the content, or motto, of this emblem selected. Entitled. Qui me alit, me e extinguit. Equals quo di me nutrit, me distrut. Equals dum nut rio, consumor. Accompanied by a six-line poem. Did appear. A. In Geoffrey Whitney's book. A choice of emblems, but also. B. In Samuel Daniels. The Worthy Tract. There we read. A torch, figured burning, and turning downward, whereby melting wax. Falling in great abundance, quench the flame. With this poesy, thereunto. Quad me a lit, me, extinguished. But believe it, or not. See. It also appeared as the painted life motto. On, true, Shakespeare's, Marlowe's, self-portrait. Note, surprisingly, that's far from the end. D, in Shakespeare's play Pericles. Marlowe's life motto, qui me alit, me distrut, appears again. When in a tournament of King Simonides for the marriage favor of his daughter, Thysa. The fourth knight explains on his board the meaning of the motto.
be aware, there is, I suspect, a deeper, autobiographical, connection. In Shakespeare's play, Pericles, Prince of Tyre. In Act 1. Scene 1. The king of Antioch has offered the hand of his daughter Thysa to any man who can answer his riddle, but will be killed if he's incorrect. Pericles knows the solution. Solving, or not solving, the riddle, however, shall have the same consequences for Pericles. His personal death. Shakespeare wouldn't be Shakespeare if he had not hidden an autobiographical, ambiguous, double meaning behind this riddle. How may it be that suddenly he exists? Yet in two, one dead and two alive. Decades later, a highly impressive, majestic, emblem book appeared, each with a 30-line moral or divine poem and additional poetical lotteries in the appendix by George Wither. The name, suspiciously reminiscent of Geoffrey Whitney. And once again, the book contains poetical emblems with Marlowe's life motto. Or riddle. 1. Qui me alit, me extinguit. And. 2. Dumb nut rio, consumer. Can it be purely coincidental that Whitney's, Marlowe's, and Daniel's motto, with his emblematic poetical content, appeared also in Wither's collection of emblems, and even in multiple form? The last two lines of the emblem poem, Dum Nut Rio, Consumer, read, So, when I quite am vanished, out of seeing, I shall enjoy my, now, concealed, being. Thank you.